So, hello everyone. It's good to have so many people back again for this week's edition of our uh, seminar series. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Claire Press. Uh, Claire did her PhD at UCL with Celia Hayes, and she worked there early on on the uh, mirror neuron system. And then after finishing her PhD, she did two fellowships with Martin Eimer and also with uh, James Kilner and uh, Friston at the film. And for the past 10 years or so, she has been a, a member of faculty at Brubeck. Is it Brubeck? Yeah. University in London. And uh, I was especially interested in uh, bringing Claire to speak because over the past few years, she's been a very consistent provider of both uh, experimental and theoretical advances on linking cognition and predictive coding, which is something we're very interested in. Last year, we did a few seminars at uh, Gonda about this. And uh, now we can hear it uh, directly from her. So Claire, thank you so much for coming and the stage is yours. Brilliant, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so my talk today is going to be focused on perception, but of course, i um, happy to speak about any of um, our lines of work afterwards. Uh, right, so, um, so what I want to focus on today are the demands that our uh, perceptual systems are facing. Uh, hang on, my slides are not advancing. Maybe it's just going to take a while. Uh, sorry about this. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I should have kept it showing from before. So um, the challenge that our sensory systems face is that we have a whole host of noisy information that is continuously bombarding our sensory receptors. And from this whole host of noisy information, our sensory systems need to construct perceptual experiences for the organism that are both veridical, so a fairly accurate representation of what is out there, but also informative, so telling the organism what it did not already know. And it's been argued widely across the last few decades that it's only possible to achieve these aims if we use predictions about what we're likely to perceive to shape our experiences. And we can make those predictions on the basis of a number of different types of information. So first of all, we can use other sensory information, such as the sensory context that we're in. <clears throat> so for instance, we can see that we're standing in the Arctic and we're therefore fairly likely to see a polar bear and fairly unlikely to see an elephant. We can also make those predictions on the basis of the actions that we perform. So we can know that we have sent most commands to move our fingers towards piano keys and we're therefore fairly likely to see fingers waggling around, to feel cutaneous stimulation on our fingertips and to hear some random uh, noises coming out from the piano. So you might then assume these are all just different types of information that we can use in a similar fashion to shape our experiences and to overcome these challenges that I outlined above. So what I therefore found somewhat um, intriguing when I first started thinking about these questions a few years ago is that there's an apparent conflict between the theories that you've seen predominating in action disciplines and those that predominate outside of action disciplines concerning the functional influence of those predictions on our experiences. And so to give the details here, the theories that prevailed outside of action, so I'm going to refer to this literature as the normative sensory cognition literature, and here I'm meaning low level visual literature asking how we perceive features of our environment such as edges and objects. The theories here, I'm going to call them upweighting because what they're broadly proposing is an upweighted perception of the expected. So these theories tend to be uh, couched within Bayesian frameworks and to be proposing via some uh, mechanism that we are combining our predictions with the incoming sensory evidence to determine our experiences. 
So in Bayesian terms, we combine the prior with the, with the likelihood to determine the posterior. And this combination process results in an uprated perception of the expected. So that is, we're more likely to perceive it and we'll perceive it more intensely. The adaptive arguments put forward for why we might want su such a mechanism is that it is very important for the organism that they generate veridical, so accurate representations of their environment and rapidly. And this is in the face of a whole host of noisy inputs that's continuously bombarding our receptors. What we expect to be there is by definition more likely to be there, assuming a certain level of stability to, to our environment. So unless something has completely changed, then what we expect to be there is in fact more likely to be there. And therefore, if we bias our experiences in line with what we have learned to be more likely to be there, it will tend to make our experiences more accurate. So if you consider these panels down here, I might be walking home one evening and I take a quick glance up the path in front of me and therefore be provided with the input that looks like this input panel on the left. So that is, it's dusk, it's not brilliant information, and I'm taking a very quick glance. I get something like this cartoonized version, just meaning it's not great input. However, I have an expectation that I should see my sons in front of me. And if I combine that expectation that I will see my sons with the input, then this combination of the input and the expectation actually provides a more accurate representation of what is in fact there than if I relied on this noisy input alone. So appears to provide a very sensible uh, description then of how we generate these veridical representations in the face of sensory noise. But in fact, these accounts are in direct opposition to what I'm going to call downweighting theories that have prevailed within action. And I'm calling them downweighting to reflect the uh, contrast with respect to outside of action. So what has been proposed widely in action is that predicted information is subtracted from perception as claimed by some, but certainly there will be some sort of attenuating process that leads us to be less likely to perceive what we expect or to perceive it less intensely. A wide variety of empirical studies put forward to support these accounts um, and the adaptive arguments put forward uh, for why we'd, we would want such a mechanism is that it would render us more able to perceive the unexpected because it's more informative to us. So that is, what is the point in perceiving the expected? It doesn't tell us anything. However, perceiving the unexpected is telling us that we need to update our models of the world, or in other words, to learn, often to perform corrective actions. We really want to be prioritizing the unexpected, and we do this by downweighting perception of the expected. Many, many studies supporting these accounts, but the accounts perhaps well known, especially to those outside of the literature, are the many, many studies demonstrating that we cannot tickle ourselves. So what has been assumed here is that you send a prediction, um, you, you, you send a motor command to say, move your fingers lightly across your skin surface, and you predict the sensory consequences of doing that. Um, and then when the input comes in that matches those expectations, you perceive it less intensely than if someone else unexpectedly tickles us. So we don't, we can't tickle ourselves because we have downweighted perception of our expected action outcomes. Okay, so when you put these theories against each other like this, uh, this appears to demonstrate somewhat uh, a conundrum that needs resolving. What it highlights very clearly <coughs> is that if you consider a continuum of expectedness, that that which is more likely to be there is also less informative. So as an event becomes more expected, it becomes something that's more likely to be there, but it's also telling us less new information. Uh, so this would be the case um, on the whole at, these at many points in this continuum. What's also very clear is that these proposed mechanisms that are acting to optimize veridicality or accuracy are directly acting against informativeness and vice versa. So if you upweight what you expect, it makes it more veridical and less informative. If you downweight what you expect, it makes your experiences more informative, less veridical. So do we really have different mechanisms operating in different domains? Or have we just have a, had a different focus in these different domains, 
on different adaptive functions and with different methodologies. So that's something we have been thinking about a lot in the last few years. Is motor prediction really likely to influence perception differently? And so first of all, you might want to think about the adaptive arguments. And um, if you consider those adaptive arguments, in fact, these appear to apply equivalently to all domains. So the arguments put forward for why we might um, want an upweighting type mechanism. So it's important that we generate veridical representations and rapidly. This would also apply to the context of action. So when we're performing our actions, it's incredibly important that we have veridical representations of them in the face of a continuous stream of noisy input. If you consider the arguments for why we might want a downweighting mechanism, so that is, it's the unexpected that is informative to us, uh, and this is going to mean we need to update our models of the world and to act upon this information. This is also the case regardless of how we predicted this information, so also outside of action. So if you walk into your living room and there's a tiger line on the sofa, um, then this is clearly very surprising information to you. It's something you definitely want to do something about and to update your models on the basis of, but you didn't predict the tiger's absence on the basis of any actions that you performed. So I think these adaptive arguments apply equally. So it might then be the case that um, it might not make intuitive sense why you need different mechanisms in different domains, but that, as I say, there's literature going back decades in both domains um, supporting these apparently contradictory accounts. Um, and therefore, we have a whole host of evidence. We need different models because the evidence is in conflict. In fact, um, upon closer inspection, I would say that this is also not the case because it is very different types of evidence that are being used in the different domains. So on the whole, the downweighting accounts in action have been supported by evidence that expected action outcomes are associated with a lower signal in sensory brain regions or less intense perceptual experiences. Whereas the upweighting accounts outside of action are supported by findings that expected sensory events are associated with a sharper neural representation, and I'll come on in a minute to what I mean by that, or a greater likelihood of detection. So I think that this renders the um, literature's not comparable, um, or the state of the literature when we first started thinking about this several years ago. So what we've therefore spent the last few years doing is to take the paradigms and analyses from normative sensory cognition to the domain of action to ask whether we see something similar or something different. So should we be persevering with these models that are in direct opposition, or do we, need, do we have something that we need to sort out theoretically here in terms of marrying these literatures? So I'm going to first tell you about a couple of MRI studies we've done because much of the evidence in support for downweighting in action comes from MRI. <clears throat> so this is found across sensory modalities. So much work was in touch finding lower somatosensory activation when you're perceiving um, expected action outcomes but also findings across the visual hierarchy, so lower visual activation when perceiving expected action outcomes. And these uh, findings of lower sensory signals are interpreted as evidence of suppression of expected sensory evident, uh, activity, so evidence in support of these downweighting accounts. However, what um, has been discussed in the uh, visual cognition literature across the last few years is that a lower sensory signal is not necessarily indicative of a downweighting type mechanism. So there was a study uh, conducted several years ago now by uh, Peter Koch, um, whereby he trained participants to expect gratings at certain orientations on the basis of preceding tones. So for instance, trained them that every time they heard a high tone, they'd be presented with a clockwise tilted grating, and every time they heard a low tone, they'd be presented with a counterclockwise oriented grating. And then they looked at the processing in primary visual cortex as a function of whether the grating they were observing was expected or not. And what they found was, so like is found um, in the action literature, but if you look at the uh, univariate levels of activation to that grating, that the gratings presented at the expected orientations in green here were associated with lower activation in primary visual cortex 
then the grey teams present it at unexpected orientations. Uh, so regardless of what task they were performing on the grey teams, um, the expected grey teams were generating a lower signal than the unexpected. However, what they also found was that if they trained and tested pattern classifiers on the basis of the um, patterns within the primary visual cortex, then you were seeing something that is not so consistent with the downrating time type account. So that is, you're seeing this pattern classifier performing better with the expected gratings than the unexpected gratings, despite the lower signal. So what might be going on here? So um, if you consider um, that primary visual cortex has units tuned towards uh, edges of many different orientations, um, so on the um, x-axis here, um, you have uh, units tuned towards edges, so say counterclockwise oriented edges, vertical edges and clockwise oriented edges. And the blue is representing a hypothetical baseline concerning what you expect to happen when you observe a vertically oriented edge. So you expect that the units encoding vertically oriented edges are more active than the units encoding edges at other orientations. So the downweighting accounts would be assuming then that this lower signal is coming about through lower activation in those units encoding what you're observing. So when you're expecting to see a vertically oriented edge, that you're having lower activation, specifically in those sensory populations, encoding vertical orientations. However, an alternative, which is presented on the right, is that instead, when you expect to see a vertically oriented edge, you pre-activate representations of vertically oriented edges, and via some sort of process like lateral inhibition, you suppress processing in all other unit types. This type of mechanism would generate a lower overall signal, but it would also lead to this superior pattern classification. And it would be more in line with the functional upweighting accounts because this type of mechanism would also then render you more likely to perceive what you expect or more intensely perceiving what you expect. So in a study uh, we conducted a couple of years ago, um, we basically asked which of these two mechanisms looks like it was at play uh, during action. So does action expectation suppress or sharpen representation of visual action outcomes? And this was a study that was uh, conducted by Daniel Yon, uh, who was in my group uh, for several years. And so what um, he did was to require participants to perform index finger abductions or little finger abductions in the scanner and that they would be observing an avatar hand on screen that was synchronized with their movements and performing congruent or incongruent movements. So that is if they're performing a congruent finger action, a congruent trial would be where the avatar is also performing a congruent action, uh, an index finger action, but an incongruent trial would be that the little finger moves. And this is assumed that the congruent movements are expected on the basis of a lifetime experience. So that is, you have much experience before you come into the scanner of moving your index finger and seeing index fingers move. You don't have very much experience at all of moving an index finger and seeing a little finger move. And then we perform some multivariate analyses on the visual activation and also some univariate analyses but separated according to the preference um, or the preferences exhibited by these uh, populations to try to understand a bit better what is going on there. And so if you first look at the decoding performance, then basically across a wide range of visual processing regions, um, we're finding that these expected action outcomes um, are decoded with superior accuracy than the unexpected action outcomes. So this was across so occipital and temporal regions. We also then, when we wanted to look at the univariate, what was going on at the univariate level, but we first wanted to start by separating our voxels according to whether they were more responsive to index fingers or to observe little fingers. Um, and we therefore asked whether the, any particular suppression that we see in the overall signal is being observed in the voxels that are tuned towards that thing that you're currently watching 
or tunes towards the other thing. And basically what we found, though very much in line with these sharpening up weighting accounts, is that any signs of suppression are all coming in the voxels tuned towards the thing you're not looking at. So to unpack this a bit, meaning if you're watching an index finger movement, then voxels that like index fingers are showing no sign of um, a lower signal on the expected relative to the unexpected trials. Or if anything, there's a trend in the other direction. However, we're seeing significant suppression in the voxels tuned towards the, index, the little fingers. So the thing you're not watching. This therefore means that both the univariate and the multivariate analyses are in line with an upweighting type mechanism during action rather than a downweighting type mechanism. And most importantly for me, consistent with what is found outside of action. So that is when a tone predicts a grating, this is exactly what they find. So there does not appear to be something that is operating in a qualitatively, qualitatively different fashion during action. We performed um, a couple of follow ups to this, but one I'm going to tell you about very briefly was asking whether these effects were really due to prediction. So, as I say, what we've got here is a congruency manipulation. So we're having participants move index fingers and then they see index fingers or see little fingers. We're assuming that any effects we observe are due to the statistical regularities of our environment such that we have come to expect that when we move our index finger, we will see index fingers moving. We don't know this because we haven't manipulated the statistical relationships within our environment. And this is how they tend to examine effects of prediction outside of action and certainly how these um, effects of data are obtained whereby tones predicted ratings. So to be sure what is reflecting the statistics of an individual's environment, um, you can be very sure if you have presented them with certain types of relationship. So that's what we wanted to do in the domain of action. So we trained participants in some probabilistic mappings such that in a training phase of hundreds and hundreds of trials, every time they performed an index finger abduction, they see a clockwise oriented grating. And every time they made a little finger abduction, they would see a counterclockwise tilted grating or the other way around. We then degraded that contingency in an MRI session such that we could include unexpected trials. So now 33% of the time you would see the expected grating based upon your action. So you perform the index finger movement and you see the clockwise oriented grating. 33% of the time you see an unexpected grating and 33% of the time in fact you see an admission. So I'm not going to go into details over why we did this but so you perform an action and you see nothing. And so most importantly for this talk we basically in primary visual cortex, uh, so we were very specific to looking just at primary visual cortex now given we have these nice, uh, uh, not very ecologically valid but well controlled grating stimuli. Um, we just looked within primary visual cortex and we saw exactly the same pattern as in our avatar study such that if you're looking at the univariate signal, um, there is no sign of a suppression in the expected relative to unexpected trials if you're looking just at those voxels tuned to what you are seeing, um, but the suppression is all coming from the voxels that are tuned towards the other grating orientation. So you're looking at the clockwise tilted grating, it's the voxels that prefer counterclockwise gratings that are showing the lower signal on the expected trials. If you are interested, and we can discuss further afterwards, um, we're also very interested in these emission trials um, basically, if we looked then at whether these voxels that are basically the pattern um, according to expectedness, but where they're not even observing anything, what we found was that the, um, there's more activation in the voxels tuned to what you expect relative to what you do not expect, despite the fact you not, do not even see anything. This is in line with this mechanistic idea that you expect a certain sensory event and you're pre-activating sensory representations at some level of those um, expected events. And this is meaning that actually you're then seeing patterns in the visual cortex in some respects as if you had actually seen it. So in line with this pre-activation idea. But more importantly, supporting what we found in the avatar study by suggesting that action is sharpening visual processing 
Um, we are pre-activating representations of expected visual action outcomes and suppressing other representations, which is leading to superior visual representation of the expected. And very importantly, for the purposes of this talk, the same influence as you observe outside of action. So more in line with up-weighting than down-weighting accounts. Um, so a different type of conclusion from what you tend to find in the action literature. It's suggestive perhaps of similar underlying mechanisms via which action expectations are influencing perception. So uh, if you want to stop me at any time, feel free or we can have a discussion afterwards. Hey, I have a question. Can yeah. I ask? Yeah, I wonder, was there any behavioral or perceptual effect of this expectation? In other words, uh, maybe some threshold phenomena or a reaction time or anything of that? Um, I, so we set this up such that, we, so not in this particular task. So um, we were, in fact, we do also have a task relevance manipulation. So sometimes they're just being asked about a colored dot on the screen because we, want, we wanted to see whether the, it had to be task relevant, the stimuli. Um, we didn't have anything meaningful we could ask about in the behavioral data. Um, I will tell you, we, I mean, that is definitely something we want to do to be asking how the neural links with the behavioral, but no, I, unfortunately not at a meaningful level, sorry. Um, but what I do want to discuss actually for the next part of my talk are some behavioral studies. So at the moment we have asked these questions separately, uh, but that is the uh, big aim for the future is to uh, be asking how the neural links with the behavioral. But so, what we have also done, and Daniel spent a lot of time uh, conducting many studies along these lines, is applying the psychophysical paradigms and analyses to the domain of action. And across the board, so there's basically three or four studies in each of these references here, we were finding effects that are all of an upweighting flavour. So all exactly what is found in the visual cognition literature when you're applying these particular paradigms that they apply there. So when we apply these same paradigms to the domain of action, we're finding evidence for upweighting. So a few visual studies, so a signal detection paradigm, whereby we found visual biases towards perceiving what we expect. Um, a couple of papers with contrast paradigms, whereby visual action outcomes are perceived with higher contrast. And then also four auditory studies in this paper, whereby we see auditory duration biases towards the duration of the actions that you're performing. So all in line with what these upweighting accounts would predict rather than the downweighting accounts. And as I say, most importantly, just showing what is found outside of action. But the psychophysical studies I want to go through in more detail today are some tactile studies. And this because, is because touch has played, had such a central stage um, role in the action literature. So this has formed the basis of much of Emily Thomas's PhD, and she's just wrapping up with me. So I'm going to focus on a couple of touch studies that she's con conducted, but as I say, psychophysical, looking actually at the contents of perception. So most support for these action theories comes from the domain of touch. Um, and it is widely believed that touch may be a, hold a special place of significance with respect to action. So a number of different possibilities have been put forward, but one of which is that motor to um, somatosensory effects might be mediated via quite different circuitry than say many of these visual effects. So for instance, it's been suggested that the motor uh, somatosensory uh, communication might be mainly operating via the cerebellum, whereas these arbitrary um, associations that you learn with respect to vision might uh, require hippocampal communication. It's quite plausible that if mediated by different circuitry, you would have very different types of functional effects. However, it might be the case that touch is working very differently, but it is also the case that these tactile paradigms in action look incredibly different from the types of paradigms that prevail outside of action, where they wish to ask whether predictions are shaping perception in a particular way. And this is because most of the paradigms have not looked at perceiving sensory events that are expected versus unexpected on the basis of the actions. Most of the paradigms are performing an action versus no action, so passive comparison. 
So for instance, they are requiring participants to perform actions and presenting sensory events uh, during those actions and asking about perception of those sensory events. And they're comparing that perception against situations where those same sensory events are presented in the absence of action or where you just misaligned the events. So the action does not really overlap temporally with the um, sensory outcomes. And these paradigms, many, many paradigms across decades, finding less intense tactile perception of the events in the action conditions relative to the passive conditions. And it's being assumed that this attenuated perception during action is due to the outcomes being predicted consequences of those actions. But action can influence perception via a wide variety of types of mechanisms, many of which will not be predictive. So predictive mechanisms being defined according to what is expected on the basis of the regularities within your environment or not. And so the way that this is pulled out, as I said before, outside of action is to actually train these relationships and then present events that are expected or unexpected on the basis of those learned relationships. You can know which outcomes reflect the statistics of your environment by having full control over them, that is training them into your participants. That's what we wanted to do in these studies that have formed uh, much of Emily's PhD. We trained participants in probabilistic relationships between actions and tactile outcomes, um, like they've done outside of action, but to see whether you get predict predictive upweighting or downweighting in the domain of touch. So in one of these studies, Emily trained them such that um, they would move their right hand index finger upwards or downwards, and this would trigger stimulation on the left hand index or middle finger. This is the bit that was hard without my video feedback. I can see you can see my hands now. So. Um, so what happens is that uh, participants would be trained with 100% contingency such that during hundreds of trials in training, every time they move their index finger upwards on their right hand, they receive stimulation on one of their fingers on their left hand. And every time they move their finger downwards, they receive stimulation on the middle finger. And importantly, we then degrade this contingency in a subsequent test session such that we can compare perception of the expected and the unexpected trials. So now if they've been trained that every time they move their index finger upwards, they get um, index finger stimulation. Um, this is now only true on 67% of trials because 33% of the time they're presented with the stimulation on the other finger. And we wish to compare the perceived force of those events on the expected or the unexpected finger. And we did this by requiring them to rate this force relative to a reference. So we presented many variable different forces. This is also something that has been done widely in these action paradigms that have demonstrated these attenuation effects. Um, and then we determined the point of subjective equivalence. Uh, so I won't go through, uh, many of you will be familiar with these uh, psychophysical uh, methods. But for those of you who are not, what you need to know is that a lower point of subjective equivalence means that you are rating this target event more forcefully. Uh, so it's basically back to front. Um, what we found in this study is that there was a lower point of subjective equivalence in these tactile force ratings on the expected relative to the unexpected trials. So indicating that expected events were perceived as more forceful than the unexpected events. And we then did a replication with different types of actions, but this time, so moving more closely to what they've done in the action literature in terms of it's always downward motion that generates stimulation on each finger, so perhaps more consistent with a naturalistic type setup. So, for instance, participants could be trained that every time they move their right hand index finger, they will receive left hand stimulation. And every time they move their um, sorry, middle finger, they will get uh, middle stimulation. Again, changing the nature of this relationship didn't change the nature of the effect. So the expected events are associated with a lower point of subjective equivalence than the unexpected. So again, demonstrating the prediction during action can increase the perceived force of tactile events. 
We then wanted to ask about the precise nature of this bias with some drift diffusion modelling. Um, so uh, what is assumed in drift diffusion modelling is that you have decision units sampling from central units across time until you receive a decision bound and then you give your response. So in this particular study, uh, what we have is so we have time going along the X axis and it's assumed that at the start of the trial, you start somewhere between these response alternatives and your decision units sample from your, sorry, my cursor keeps disappearing, so I'm going to get a bit confusing. Um, you sample the decision units, sample from the central units until they've received enough evidence to have crossed one of these decisional bounds. And then you give your response of stronger than reference, weaker than reference. So one way you could generate such a bias is um, to a start point bias. And this is what many have proposed in the literature you would expect if the decisional process is directly biased. So if regardless of incoming evidence, you have just decided at the start of the trial that you are going to, if you're, you're, you're more likely to want to respond that something is stronger, um, then you shift the start point of your evidence accumulation process. And this shifting of the start point means that you more quickly um, or you are more like you, you reach more quickly this bound for responding stronger. However, an alternative way that you can generate these effects is to keep your start point in the same place, but to modulate the gradient of your evidence accumulation. And this is what is called a drift biasing. And this is more like what um, has been proposed to be expected if your central units are biased. So if your decisional process is not itself biased, but you're sampling across time from central units that are biased, then this is a bias that should increase across time because every time you sample from the units, you're sampling from biased units and therefore you, uh, you are more likely to say this. You're, you're going to uh, be more readily reaching this respond stronger bound than the respond weaker bound. So we wanted to know which of these two was going on uh, to, to try to start to distinguish between decisional and sensory accounts of this process. What we actually found, um, awkwardly, was that the best model was one that included both types of bias. So a model that allowed the start and the drift biases to vary according to expectation produced the best fit to the empirical effects that we saw. Um, but what we were concerned with was not whether there was a decisional contribution, but whether there was a sensory contribution in there. So we don't really mind if there's a decisional effect as long as there is an additional sensory effect. So um, and we indeed found evidence for that. So basically, once we had accounted for any variance in start point biasing, then the drift biasing was accounting for significant amounts of variance in this empirical effect that we observed. So there's a contribution of sensory biases to this effect is what has been suggested by those data. So importantly, from uh, these studies, uh, we're finding then that expected tactile action outcomes are perceived as more intense or forceful than unexpected. So in combination with our earlier vision and auditory work, this is suggesting that when we employ the paradigms and analyses from outside of action to action, we get similar effects to those out observed outside of action. So similar upweighting perceptual and neural findings, similar support for these Bayesian types of models whereby we are combining our predictions with the incoming evidence to determine what we perceive. So feel free again to stop me there or we can, uh, there's just one part left to my talk now whereby I will try to marry together what we have been observing. So if I can take a question there? Yep. So I'm wondering if there's not something here which relates actually to attention or to the precision weighting because here where you're creating a yep. task where unlike the normal, normally we would maybe want to suppress kind of outcomes of you know, walking, you don't want to be yep. sensing your footsteps on each uh, stride, right? Yep. But if I direct attention there, then I can definitely divulge a lot of information, which is... Yep. Uh, so when... Absolutely. Um, so I think this is actually so... I mean, across the last couple of decades, in fact, it's, a, it's something that comes back very frequently for sort of the extent to which attention is generating the effects. And so one part of my answer is, I think these effects are exactly the same as many of the effects that are written up in the attention literature, like sort of Posner-Cuing paradigms with 70-30 manipulations. 
I think many of these mechanisms here are highly overlapping. I think where the difficulty comes is obviously defining exactly what we mean by attention. And so actually, so what I, what I like about these studies looking at expectation is that I think you can make this incredibly well defined according to statistics of the environment. And therefore you can sort of start to hammer down exactly what you're studying because it's a very well defined concept. Attention is only distinguishable from expectation if you use the definitions that Chris Summerfield um, proposed in his Nature Reviews Neuroscience paper about a decade ago, um, whereby you define it according to task relevance. So if you just say that that um, that's attended, the things that are attended are the things that are task relevant in this particular instance, then you can very much orthogonalize them. And that is something that we have done in some of these studies. So that avatar study, we actually, as I um, said in answer to the um, earlier question, we actually had a two by two. So we had expected, unexpected, and we also had task relevant, task irrelevant. So you could be asked a question about those particular stimuli, or you could be asked a question about something else on the screen. And so the effect was not, well, the effects I presented to you there didn't change according to task relevance. So I definitely think that these are effects of probabilities rather than task relevance because we have orthogonalized it. Whether you could also call that attention, possibly according to other definitions, but I also think, yeah, it's a matter of sort of trying to pull apart where, where we have been studying the same thing and where it's different, but where in my mind, I think, um, yeah, it, you could equally say that the attentional findings are due to expectation. I think it's, <laughs> it's a sort of, it's a murky, it's a murky distinction, but where, um, as I say, according to task relevance, it's definitely distinct. <laughs> okay, great. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm curious uh, how you think about the following phenomena. It's a very robust phenomena in the visual system. Yeah. Uh, it's called repetition suppression or yeah. adaptation. And yeah. typically it was interpreted as a downweighting kind of, uh, uh, of effect because, you know, you have, you know, if you repeat the stimulus, you yeah. know that it's coming, therefore you get a lower signal. So how does it fit in your thinking? How do you interpret it? Very good question. I mean, it's something that I am similarly puzzled by. Um, so I guess one thing is, so, I mean, it's been proposed that these repetition effects could operate according to predictive mechanisms. So like some of Floris Delonga's work and Chris Summerfield's work, where they pitch repetition against expectations such that the alternations are expected. They've managed to sort of pull apart to show that much of the repetition effects are due to, to expectation. Um, to the extent that it would be generated by similar underlying mechanisms, um, then I would very much be interested in asking how what we're saying marries up with that. But certainly I know it's far from a clear cut picture and lots of Rick Henson's work over the years has found many repetition enhancement effects and where he has tried to come up with um, how you would marry these together. I mean, I know there was the recent debate in there was the Alink Nature Communications paper a couple of years ago where they said that repetition effects did not operate according to sharpening but rather according to global local scale uh, to global scaling of the response and um, that would appear to therefore possibly suggest a difference in underlying mechanism but uh, there was an NIH response to that a couple of months ago that basically refuted that um, conclusion so yeah, I, I think it's very likely that many of the repetition effects would come down to similar mechanisms. But as I say, I think they're um, facing many of these similar challenges of it not being quite as cut and dry as would be a nice pretty picture. So yeah, I mean, I think um, we're going to end up having to try to integrate these literatures as well. Okay, thanks. Um, Patients okay. take, take time. Oh. Can I one more yeah, yeah. question? So, how fast do these expectations come about? I mean, it takes time to form expectations yes. and these um, effects are seen pretty much immediately. Very good question. So on the basis of our studies, all we've done in all our studies so far is basically to train them for 600 trials or something on one day, bring them back the next day where they get another 100 trials to remind them and then we test. So we've just been interested in Right, we want to set up something where we can be sure they've picked it up because we only give them two things to learn and um, we want to be sure they've picked it up and we want to sort of try to marry it with what's found outside of action how long it takes to come about and how the mechanism might change as it comes about is something incredibly intriguing 
um, I think. Um, certainly, I spoke over the summer with Nick Turk Brown because they have um, findings where they've shown different types of effects emerge across a few days of picking something up, but where they're specifically interested in these arbitrary links um, and hippocampal roles. Um, and so, certainly, so I think what they appeared to find was that so immediately when you train something, that you were basically having uh, your your predictions weren't quite as precise, but that basically the hippocampal role was sort of say day one to day four would be sharpening it up. So it, it's sort of that you're you do have something there immediately, but that maybe after a couple of days, certainly to involving some sleep consolidation appears to look like it's possibly important too. So also Matt Davis in speech perception, they've had some findings that change dramatically if you've allowed someone to sleep in between or not. So if you test immediately, that many of the effects aren't quite as uh, specific. Um, but yeah, I, so I don't know on the basis of our findings. It's something I would like to know. But um, but yeah, as I say, I think yeah, they probably take a while a, a while to emerge. Or certainly, I would assume if you're looking for something that's operating at the speed that it could say influence action control or something, it can't be something where the subject is still there trying to you know, on any explicit level, figure it out. I mean, this is something that is automatized over many hundreds of trials, I would assume. <laughs> um, okay, um, it'd be interesting afterwards to uh, discuss because I'm just saying what I think about this. I'd like to know what you think about it. So, um, so just for the final part of my talk, um, I want to then say about basically some theoretical work, maybe more than empirical, concerning what we think we should do then about the fact that we've now found all these upweighting effects in action. So one possible conclusion is just discard these downweighting theories. Um, so that is, um, some of these effects that have been interpreted in, according to downweighting, I have outlined how we think that's not necessarily the right interpretation. So certainly many of these bold findings, you get a lower univariate signal, we don't necessarily think that's reflecting downweighting. Certainly, too, the mechanism does not appear to be operating as has been outlined um, in much of the action literature because those accounts would have predicted opposite effects to what we find. However, I am very much not of the opinion that we should discard all that comes with those theories. So I think there are many findings within action that show solid predictive downweighting effects. Um, it's not all of the type that you can just reshuffle things and it turns into an upweighting mechanism. So some solid predictive downweighting effects and also, in fact, outside of action. So evidence for predictive downweighting, say, in vision. Um, so where you just have sort of a you've learned regularities between event uh, object sequences. Very strong evidence for predictive downweighting that doesn't fit so well with these upweighting theories um, that we would obviously want to know mechanistically how we explain this. It's also the case that the adaptive arguments put forward for why we want to divert, uh, devote processing resources to the unexpected, I think are incredibly important arguments. So if we have events in our environments that will mean we want to potentially update our models of the world, we really do want to divert many perceptual processing resources towards them because we need to know what is there to update our models in an accurate fashion. So what we've been thinking about recently is how we can optimise both juridical and informative perception via our expectations. And what we've been thinking about and um, wrote about in a Trends in Cognitive Sciences paper this year is what we can learn from the learning and inference literature. So it's obviously known by all, no one must dispute a bi-directional link between learning and perception. So, of course, we will only learn to the extent that we perceived something. And all of my talk so far has been describing how our learned models of the world impact upon our experiences. However, I think there are some particular findings um, and reasoning within the learning literature that need to be incorporated within these perceptual models that have not yet been. So these particular findings are findings that relate to processes that operate reactively to the presentation of a surprising event. So there's a range of processes that have been outlined. So phasic catecholaminergic release, so of both dopamine and noradrenaline, and the cards towards the unexpected, 
but all of which are processes that have been shown to influence our ability to learn. So that is this phasic release of both dopamine and noradrenaline has been associated with a more plastic brain, a greater ability to learn about any changes in the environment. One possibility for how this might link with perception is that these processes, in fact, increase the sensory gain related to this surprising event. And this might be how you generate the effect on learning. So you allow your sensory information to be increased before the model updating to allow you to update your models in an accurate fashion. And very importantly, too, these these learning um, experiments have been in the context of unexpected events that are generating a high level of surprise. So that is um, perception literature on the whole is calling things expected or unexpected. It's not deviating, sorry, it's not distinguishing between this panel on the left and the panel on the right. We think it is very important to distinguish these cases. So that is, um, are you presenting a sensory event that's um, generating pretty much no overlap with what you expected on the basis of your prior? So that would be more like the panel on the right. Or are you presenting a sensory event that's more akin to what is on the left here, whereby it might be labelled unexpected, but it's a such a noisy input that it's really not, that it's not generating much deviance with respect to your prediction. And the reason that we think this might be important is that because of the different paradigms in the different literatures, there's a difference in the levels of surprise that's elicited by the unexpected. And this is due to the use of intensity paradigms in the whole in the action literature and signal detection paradigms outside of action. In a signal detection paradigm, you're presenting a very weak unexpected signal. It's not going to present, it's not going to even cross decision threshold half the time, but certainly it's not providing very clear sensory evidence that is inconsistent with your expectation. And that's in contrast with an intensity judgment where you're always presenting a very clear signal, and this is going to therefore be generating a large discrepancy with respect to what you predicted. So what we have proposed, and we very much want to now test this, is that so regardless of how you make your predictions. Um, prediction will be initially biasing your perception towards what you expect to generate a broadly accurate um, representation of your environment and rapidly. And you do this by pre-activating the sensory representations of what you expect. But if evidence comes in that is especially surprising, so not in line with sensory noise, then you have post-perceptual reactive processes that are increasing the sensory gain associated with that event and allowing you to generate a superior representation of it before model updating. So for instance, going back to this Arctic example, you're in your Arctic expecting your polar bears, you see this flash of grey in the periphery, you don't simply now update your models of the world to say, okay, no, actually elephants are quite likely, or you know, elephants are more likely than I thought in the Arctic because I just saw one. You increase many perceptual processing resources to that, to determine what it was and generate a very high precision representation of it before you update your models. But these are all reactive processes that are operating to highlight something truly unexpected rather than any preemptive downrating of what you expect. Implications of this theory. Um, one big one is that you don't have a different influence of action predictions on perception, which um, does have quite a lot of knock-on effects. So first of all, uh, there are some predictive processing active inference claims that action influences perception very differently from other types of prediction, um, which effectively involves ignoring sensory evidence. We have we, we, we think that these types of claims uh, need some rethinking. Um, and there are many assumptions that sensory attenuation is playing a key defining role in determining our agency. We also think that this um, once some rethinking, if in fact you're just as likely to get sensory attenuation on the basis of other types of events um, predicting uh, our experiences. What I want to very quickly outline in the remaining few minutes now um, are also so an empirical um, prediction that's made that actually is actually supported by some evidence we've already collected, but which would appear to play into this um, idea that we have at present. 
So this is that behavioural and neural effects should switch across time when you're presenting events that are very surprising. So in intensity type judgments, you should see that the expected is perceived with greater intensity very early on. But once you've allowed these reactive processes to operate, this effect should flip over such that now the unexpected um, is perceived very intensely. And so these, this was three experiments that we conducted whereby participants moved their index or middle finger, I think it was in these studies, and they rated the perceived intensity or brightness of visual action outcomes, which are avatar finger movements, so congruent or incongruent finger movements. And they judged the brightness of these finger movements at different points after the sensory event has been presented, so 50 milliseconds later or 200 milliseconds later. And without giving you uh, the details here, you can ask me the details if you want, across three experiments, we basically saw this flip that you would expect under the opposing process theory. If 50 milliseconds after you show the event, the expected event is perceived to be brighter or more intense than the unexpected, but by 200 milliseconds, so we're talking a really rapid time scale here, it's entirely flipped over. And we saw this flip over three times. So this is not consistent with a pure down weighting or a pure up weighting account, but in line with the idea that you have these opposing processes operating at distinct time scales. So to summarise, um, we think our work from the last few years has indicated that action predictions may not have a distinct down weighting or what's often called cancelling influence on perception, because when we apply the paradigms analyses from outside of action, we get support for up weighting across vision, audition and touch and neurally and behaviourally. So we now very much want to test how we optimise both veridical and informative perception. But at present, we think the solution will likely apply across perceptual domains. They will not be specific to action. But of course, I'm very much open to any ideas from any of you who uh, may disagree with that, because as this is very much uh, where we want to go now and questions that we are thinking about. Um, so thank you very much uh, to everyone for listening and to everyone who conducted the work. So mainly Daniel and Emily led these streams of work, Vanessa and Rosie, um, who are also in the lab, were collaborating. And then Floris and Peter have collaborated on much of it. And then Sam, uh, Rich Ivory and Martin Eimer on uh, other parts. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Claire, for an amazing talk. Okay. We have time for a few questions. Want to start off? Hold on, I'll get a yeah. group view. Okay, so I'll start off with a question that people warm up. Okay, so uh, I really like your uh, model from the ticks uh, about how trying to bring these two to together. And I think there's even some evidence from that from the uh, realm of the uh, action representation and agency. So going back to the Nielsen paradigm, uh, when you have a discrepancy between what you're doing and what you're seeing happen, you will actually correct for instance, for an angular deviation, if it's small, because this would be considered a kind of sensory noise. Yes. And this will not come up to your explicit awareness. You'll not be, you yes. will not really know about this. However, yes. once you cross the boundary, then this will be kind of tossed up possibly to higher levels of the hierarchy, bringing out a sense that this is not what you're doing. And yes. this also brings me to my question. A lot of the uh, neural regions you've been looking at have been very low level regions, okay? Mm -hmm. So you might expect that the low-level visual regions could ex behave in one way, but once a surprise goes to a certain level, it gets kicked up to frontal regions or like regions yes. higher in the hierarchy. Yes. Yeah, um, I think that sounds, I think your thinking sounds in line with how I would tend to think about these things too. And I agree that many of those agency type studies concerning the type of signal that enters into awareness, um, I think, yes, indeed, that these low deviations are a lot of the time not. So certainly they're not entering into awareness of a deviation. I think there's some interesting questions there concerning the extent to which we can truly hallucinate when it's not even there, um, but they're very much open books and not answered. But yes, I, I think certainly many of the times you're sort of perceiving the expected, but when you've got the input coming in that's expected, you don't necessarily draw the distinction between that and what you were perceiving before it came in. Um, but so certainly, yes, I would agree that um, but it's far more likely to be entering awareness, say, when you get this unexpected information. And I very much agree, too, that frontal systems are going to play a much larger role on these when, when it's coming in, when you have something truly model breaking um, that is coming in that means you have to change your models of the world. Yeah, we focused 
I mean, I think these questions we probably, yeah, we want to be focusing on the century regions. And so, yeah, you're right that a lot of it has been sort of primary visual cortex or like these touch judgments that are, I mean, of course, we're not a particular century region per se, but it's force. It's a very low level tactile phenomenon. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, I'm not sure I necessarily expect the role to change as you shift the position in the century hierarchy. But I would very much agree with you that as soon as you're talking, say, a frontal mechanism, that, that what it's doing is quite different, probably. Good. Any other questions? Um, may I ask a question? Sorry. Hey, uh, so first of all, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, in the classic uh, uh, literature of uh, action perception, uh, the comparison is mainly between active condition and passive condition. Yeah. And this is when you, you see the uh, strong, uh, down, uh, 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 strong attenuation of the stimuli. Yeah. Uh, in your study, what you showed, and maybe I missed something, you showed the enhancement, but the enhancement was relative to expected versus unexpected yeah. stimuli. Mm -hmm. And you uh, never compared it to a uh, passive stimulus, either expected or unexpected. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, maybe we don't look at, uh, uh, at any controversy here. Maybe you, we look at a different components of the, uh, of the phenomena. Uh, yeah, very good question. So um, I agree with you that, um, of course, so what we wanted to do with the expected versus unexpected comparison was to render it more comparable to the domains outside of action. But of course, in trying to then explain what's going on in action, we need to have performed the conditions that look like those performed in action. So in fact, we did have an experiment and I should have put slides um, in at the end of my talk, but I haven't. We had another experiment where we performed the classic active passive comparison. The reason I, one of the reasons I don't include it is that we're not quite really sure how to interpret it. So basically what we, so we did something where we completely replicated all the, the, the so like the Paul Bayes classic paradigm that Constantina Kilteni is now using a lot, whereby you perform an action with tactile feedback itself that then um, generates an effect on a passive effector. And we did replicate that finding whereby the active events are rated as less forceful than the passive events. But what we also did is to create a condition where we removed the simulation from the active effector. And so we now tracked the movement with motion tracking that generated this um, event. And basically the effect flipped over. And so such that you now, the active events were perceived as more forceful than the passive events. What we have speculated in the paper, but it's just certainly not the thing we would want to rest heavily on, is that basically there's been a large effort in the action literature, as you will be aware of, to distinguish between a predictive mechanism, whereby you're specifically attenuating the things that you expect, versus essentially gating, which is that basically anything on a moving effector is attenuated. And the reason that people want to distinguish those is that um, a sensory gating mechanism is definitely likely to be operating via different mechanisms because like um, like with the Saki and Fett findings that it would actually operate even at a spinal level. But this is just gating like an anesthesia to anything you present on a moving effector, but it's certainly not operating according to statistics of the environment. Um, and it's been yeah, done such that you would um, distinguish those accounts by then asking about perception on the passive effector. But what we think is a possibility is that when you can currently receive the stimulation on the moving effector, so these are basically yoked in time, you're going to have an attenuated percept of that due to gating, which in principle could bias your responses about the passive one. And so we therefore think it's a possibility that when you've removed any stimulation from the active effector, that's why the effect flips over. But as I say, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't want to push hard on that because there are other differences when you basically do or do not have stimulation on an active effector. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So do you have a new theory as to why we can't tickle ourselves? <laughs> um, very good question. Um, I mean, certainly, I guess, so with the supposing process theory, we're not proposing, um, so, so we're certainly proposing situations in which the unexpected gets very much enhanced. So I guess potentially something along those lines. I mean, I, I find it, yeah, I mean, when I, I find it very hard to decide what I think about tickling though, because it's such a bizarre phenomenon, because something else that has um, 
I feel, although I've never conducted a study on, is that, um, that, that things are more tickly when they're less intense. <laughs> so I sort of think that that is also a complication when you're talking about tickliness. But yeah, more broadly, we're not saying, yeah, I mean, we're trying to think, to come up with our theoretical account for how you could get these downweighting effects still. But yeah, good question. <laughs> I would think that the typical uh, li literature would suggest yes. uh, that it's not gating, but rather something more specific. Yes. If you change a bit the orientation or the timing, then already the tickliness goes up. Yeah, very true. Yeah, and um, so that's the thing. So it's obviously, it's not, it's not over the decades. It's not pure active passive comparisons. I mean, the, the manipulation most commonly is a misalignment so where I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's possible then that gating influences things more, well, more when they are aligned because there is more of the events that is taking place during a gating process. I mean, the Constantina Kilteni study last year then that, that had some training studies and then found or concluded that attenuation was predictive. Um, but actually coming back to the... Um, Malak's earlier question that basically the, 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 our concern with that was that they had confounded repetition and expectation because they only trained one mapping which meant that basically that which was predicted was also repeated um so yeah I don't know yes it's, uh, do you have a view uh your mic thing yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> um the problem I mean my issue with these tactile um, uh, paradigms yeah. is that you basically have tactile stimulation to the other hand. Yeah. So there could be some crosstalk between motor and somatosensory cortex, yes. which might influence. That's why yes. we usually prefer to stick to audio motor rather yeah. than sensory yeah, motor. No, I yeah, no, you ha yeah, I like I like many of your studies with it, but where um, I, yeah, I mean, I guess in many respects it does also depend on what you're, what you're concerned with. So my understanding with, so it depends if you want to. I mean, I, the literature outside of action defines prediction as just being according to the regularities within your environment, and that's also what these predictive processing models do. They don't necessarily need it to have been learned, but by definition for it to be predictive, it needs to reflect the statistical regularities. So it might have been for our ancestors, but certainly, I mean, it's studied with learning type paradigms a lot. I mean, if you're talking, I mean, something I would be open to the idea of too is so very direct motor sensory links that are not operating according to probabilities in this way but where I mean obviously the motor map and the somatosensory map are aligned in terms of body parts mm -hmm. that you could have I mean that in some broad sense reflects some regularities because it is the case that when you move your hand you get stimulation on your hand but and it's sort of therefore hardwired in as well to a certain extent that the hand representation occupies the space um, next to the hand representation. So the motor and the smart sensory maps talk. Um, of course, yeah, so I guess so It's you're... not only tactile stimulus of the target hand, but also tactile input. Yes, uh, and so that's... Through the stimulating hand. So in fact, but so actually, so I probably didn't make that clear. In the studies of Emily's, that's what we tried, to, we removed. And this was basically because so this was, so our first experiment was just active passive comparison. Do we find the attenuation effect that's usually observed? And the answer was yes. Yeah. But that was where a button press generated the tap. We then actually, for everything else in that paper, we've gone, we, we've had the motion tracked finger movement. Yeah. So there's no cutaneous stimulation. I mean, I'm not saying the somatosensory cortex is silent, but um, certainly it's not direct touch. But I don't know. Do you have a view about exactly what that cross talk would look like? I mean, yeah, seemingly less of a problem, but not completely removed. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the the tactile input to the moving hands could influence um, yeah. the somatosensory feedback, the reafferent signals yes. to the other yes. hands. Yes, yes, um, yes. 
And uh, but in, so I think um, that was part of our issue with why we wanted to then remove it and why we then sort of point out that it could. Yeah, I mean, not. Yeah, yeah I mean, yes. Yeah, so, OK, so I think so. I mean, the, what we were focused on was how actually you could get these effects just by a response biasing that you receive something here that you perceive very weakly and by a response biasing that changes how you respond about this. But you're mm -hmm. right that you would also expect some direct communication. Um, but yeah, yeah, as I say, the effect flips over. Um, if you, <laughs> I can send you our paper because we've only, yeah, only wrote this up a couple of months ago, but um, yeah. yeah, it flips over, but we have much to ask about why. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So uh, I suggest we now thank Claire for a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> and there's much, much more to be learned and done here. Claire, thanks for also sharing stuff that's coming up. I think this is a, one of the central issues that we have to deal now in a cognitive neuroscience to try and do, bring together the old views and what happens now with predictive coding. Yes, no, exactly. Yeah. Hammering it down on which bits are testable. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. big passion of mine. <laughs> Great. So thanks a lot, Claire. Thanks a lot for everyone. And I'll be seeing you all next week. Bye. Really? Keep safe. Thank you. Bye, Claire. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye. Thanks. Bye. bye.